I recently studied uh, First John. Let's jump into the sermon. First John, and I used uh, my dad's notes from 2009 as one of my study aids. And that was necessary because while I was reading, I paused on the opening verses because I wasn't sure that I knew what it meant. So please turn to 1 John. We're going to read uh, scripture, and then we're going to go into some depth. So 1 John, please. This Matt feels new. Is this new? Nice and soft. Thank you. 1 John in verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Big long sentence. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And this is where I pause to reflect. I have fellowship with the Father. And I wondered, what is fellowship? What is fellowship exactly? Is it prayer? Since John says, truly, truly we have fellowship with the Father, it feels like something bigger than just prayer. And whatever it is, we also have it with Christ. So let's keep reading. Verse 4. And these things I write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So it seems walking in the light is an important factor in fellowship. Is fellowship with him being Christian? Is it like after church where we talk to each other and we share how it's going and what's going on, except we do that with the Father? Well, let's keep reading, see if we can gain some more clarity. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Okay, so this says that if we walk like the Father walks in light, that we have fellowship with each other. And it's also important because being in this state allows us to be cleansed from sin. So fellowship feels like something bigger than prayer and conversation between brethren. What is fellowship exactly? In this message, I hoped and intend to refresh our understanding of fellowship, perhaps deepen it, and then we'll talk about how it directly impacts our Passover preparation and the observance of the key. So what is fellowship? Let's start with a working definition, and then we'll take a look at how it's used through Scripture. And for those that like Strong's numbers, this is G24, sorry, 2842. And Expositor's Bible Commentary says this is a Greek word called fellowship, and it's not easy to put it into English. It's been translated as fellowship, union, participation, a shared common life, and a partnership. It comes from a root word meaning common or shared, as opposed to one's own. So let's take a look at 2 Peter 1, and we'll take a look at this, this root word, this parent word, from which... Uh, our term fellowship is derived, so we head in the right direction. But there's a lot of ways you could go, and we want to head in the right direction. So we're going to go to Second Peter in verse 1. This is also a very long sentence, so we'll read the whole sentence to get the full scope. 
And we'll take a look at this root word. This is G2844, if you're going to Strong's numbers. Uh, and it's the parent of our term fellowship. But it sets, again, that broad frame, that broad route that we're going to head down. Uh, 2 Peter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given to, sorry, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. That through these, this is the power and the knowledge that we have, and now we're coming to our focus word, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So here, partakers. This is that parent root word headed down the path of common or shared. God shares his divine nature with us. And therefore, it's something that the Father and you and I have in common. It's not our own, because it's shared from the Father. And therefore, it's common between the two. Now, if you partake in something, and I also partake in something, we share that in common. This is the root word. And from it, we launch into two derivatives. The first is a noun, and the second is a verb. These are sharper more precise, narrower words that increase our understanding. So let's start first with the noun, which is person, place, thing, or idea. And this brings us back to that word that we're studying, fellowship, G2842. And it's the word that we read four times in five verses in the book of John, the first fellowship. So let's look how else it's used in Scripture. So please turn to Ephesians 3. Four times in five verses. John wanted to make sure that we understood it. But here we're going to look at Ephesians 3 and verse 8. To me... Who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages was hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. So Paul continues by declaring this reality that we understand this reality, we should have boldness and confidence. His point, though, in verse 8, is that there is fellowship of the mystery. God shared this mystery through Paul's preaching. And if you know the mystery, and I know the mystery, then we share in the mystery, and we both have fellowship in the mystery. It's not yours, and it's not mine. It's something that we share and have in common. Therefore, we, you and I, then become partakers of each other and the mystery of God. That's what Paul is saying. Let's take a look at Philippians, another place where this is used, another example. In Philippians 2, please. As we round out our understanding of fellowship and how it's used, the noun, a person, place, thing, or idea, We'll start in verse 1, and here in the church of Philippi, they provided financial support to Paul, and he opens this book by remarking how he thanked God for them and their fellowship in the gospel, is how he frames it. And he continues by stating that their conduct should be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Philippians 2, verse 1. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. 
Now, I really like David Stern's translation. He's a Jewish writer who uh, translated the New Testament. And this is how he frames it. This is how he writes. Therefore, if you have any encouragement for me from being in union with the Messiah, any comfort flowing from love, any fellowship with me in the Spirit, or any compassion or sympathy, then complete my joy by being by having a common purpose, common love, by being one in heart and mind. See, fellowship is something more than just a common sharing. It's more precise than that root common word. If you have the Spirit, and I have the Spirit, and we share in the Spirit, and we have fellowship in the Spirit, and just as the Philippian church, the Philippi, the church in Philippi, <laughs> and Paul were partners in preaching the gospel, so we are partners in the Spirit. And it's not just us. We partner with the Father and the Son as well. We are in union with each other. Let's look at a third example. This one's a little tricky. It's in 2 Corinthians and chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6. And this one's tricky because it uses the English term fellowship and the English term communion. It uses both of them uh, in the same verse. Uh, and our focus word is communion in this case. 2 Corinthians 6 and uh, verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? Now, communion, again, is our focus word. And this reads like a parallelism, if you're familiar with Proverbs or the idea of parallelisms. Usually you have two similar statements, and the second one, intensifies the point. It's not just a repeating of the point that was made in the first sentence. It's, it's an intensification of it. And this is exactly how this one is written. So we have fellowship with righteousness and lawlessness, and we have communion between light and darkness. And there is a subtle difference. Let me explain the difference using this kind of analogy. One of the challenges our young adults face is they come to church and sit with somebody else, usually of the opposite sex. And this is high pressure because everybody in church is noticing what's happening. And they're all wondering, well, are you serious? What's going on? Right? You have that pressure of what exactly is happening. Now, I might say that Susan is with David. Or I might say, Susan is with David. And that difference in tone and expression says all. There are degrees of intimacy. And in Greek, I can express that through different words that I choose to use. There are degrees of sharing. There is a limited sharing, and there is sharing in full. There's sharing that is less intimate, and there's sharing that is more intimate. And so, to clarify Paul's parallelism, you know, righteousness and lawlessness, they don't share very much at all. They don't have much in common. And even more so, light and dark share nothing. It's a deeper and more intimate uh, sharing, in this case, the opposite of that, but a complete lack of sharing. And so there are different Greek words for that, and they've chosen to use different English words, fellowship and communion. Because light and dark cannot be joined together. They can't be in union. And that's his point. There is no communion between darkness and light, no fellowship. So as we fill out our understanding and definition to better understand 1 John, uh, 
there's a Hebrew word as well that is very similar to that. I'll just refer to it because it's only used once in Scripture, and it's found in Leviticus 6. Uh, and this, uh, ver this verse outlines different kinds of lying and different kinds of theft. And um, it, specifically, this one is about defrauding a partner. And Matthew Henry writes in his commentary that if a man lies and steals by claiming they have sole interest in something that is actually shared, if you're in a business partnership with somebody and you say, oh, this is all my stuff, that's both lying and stealing, uh, you are, um, you know, you've broken that joint interest. With business partners, life partners, they're in joint endeavors with each other, and that's how this verse is used, uh, this joint pairing up in the Hebrew. So what have we learned so far? That fellowship as a noun means that we are a partner or we have something joined to somebody else in a common interest. And fellowship includes being in union with another. Now let's take a look at the verb side. This is the second derivative of that root word on the verb side. If you and I are in fellowship, then we are partners with each other. And the verb of this relationship, the action word, is to share, as in a joint endeavor. We're going to go do this thing together. And as we discussed, there are degrees of sharing. It can be less intimate or more intimate. We might be partners in part, or we might be partners fully, to the fullest extent. And just like in the noun, there's different different words to express that difference, the same is true for the verb. There are degrees of sharing. So let's take a look uh, at 1 Timothy 5, please. And we'll look at the verb side of this. For those, again, that like uh, Strong's numbers, this is Strong 2841. 1 Timothy and chapter 5. laying the groundwork here to make sure we have a clear understanding of fellowship, and then we'll talk about the implications of that. So this is Paul's instruction to Timothy, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 22, which says, Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. Now there is a whole sermon here, but what Paul advises is that Timothy joins himself to another person through anointing and becomes a sharer of that person's deeds. Now there are there is accountability between partners. The actions of one partner reflect on the other. Just consider somebody makes an inappropriate joke or comment and the partner gets one that much, right? Because there's shared accountability between partners. But Paul opens the door even wider by stating that Paul's, excuse me, Timothy's purity can become corroded based on this sharing. Now there's a whole sermon here, but my point is that fellowship is an action word, the verb as well, and those actions have consequences. Now in the Old Testament, there's a Hebrew word. There's actually three equivalent Hebrew words. One means to choose, one means to unite, and another means to pledge, as in to be surety for a financial obligation. It's all of the proverb which talks about don't be surety for somebody else, um, and, and that's a form of this common sharing idea. Um, but in, in the case of, of to unite, here's an example. When God gave Moses instructions for building the tabernacle in the wilderness, he received those plans, and in those plans, God says that there are curtains that should be joined together their entire length. And it uses the Hebrew firm of this action word to join. And uh, another lex lexicon says to unite, to join, to bind together, to be coupled, to be in league, to have fellowship. So you could say that these curtains fellowshiped together in the tabernacle. They were joined through the entire length. 
So now let's put this all together in one final scripture as we get the details of fellowship. Please turn to 1 Corinthians 10. Because it puts all of these words that we've looked at together in one section. And as we put it all together, we'll see it and we'll study it. And this introduces the topic of Passover, which we'll come to next. So here Paul encourages the church in Corinth to flee idolatry. He starts the chapter by remarking how Israel had shared in the spiritually supplied food and water, and they still became corrupted through idolatry and lust. Then Paul connects this to the Passover service and fellowship. So we're going to read it one time through, and then we'll take it all apart for the different words that are used and, and to make the key point. So verse 16. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and, and verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What am I saying then? That an idol is anything, or what is offered to an idol is anything? Rather, that these things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Now we've used the noun and the verb and all that through here, so let's now break it apart and tease it out. So verse 16, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not the communion, this is the noun, the fellowship, the joint partnership? Is this not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion, exact same word, of the blood of Christ? Sorry, the, the body of Christ. Because you see, in, in Romans, Paul talks about becoming joint heirs with Christ when we suffer. And these symbols picture us being united with Christ in all things. Verse 17. For we, though many, are one bread and one body. Now that sounds like joint partnership. One. For we partake all of that one bread. Now this is that lesser sharing, that, that, that partaking that's less intimate. And I assume that he uses this less intimate word because we don't actually eat the flesh of Christ. And there, so therefore, we don't fully partake. Verse 18, observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? And here he uses that complete version, that com the complete sharing term, because one fully eats of that sacrifice, the physical sacrifice. Now what is this sacrifice that he refers to? This is the peace offering, which the Tanakh, a Jewish translation, it calls this the sacrifice of well-being. We also call it the fellowship offering. Why do we call it the fellowship offering? Well, everyone took part in that sacrifice. Right? God enjoyed his share of that sacrifice. The priests enjoyed their share of that sacrifice. The giver enjoyed their share, and they could invite guests along, and those people enjoyed their share. Everyone shared in that one sacrifice, the peace offering. And it was good. I think I would call it, it's the whole good sacrifice. And the reason for that is there's no friction anywhere at the table. The sin offering had already been done, so sin is out of the way. It had been atoned for, and now you're sitting down in a fantastic meal, enjoying it. And there's no tension in heaven, there's no tension on earth. 
the peace offering. And everybody shares it. Wouldn't that be a great meal to enjoy, sitting around one table and enjoying a delicious meal? It would be fantastic. So, from that position, Paul then invites his readers to reflect on what table do they eat from. If you use my grammar, right? Verse 19, what am I saying then? Is an idol anything, or what is offered to an idol is anything? Rather, that the things that the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice the demons and not to them. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. This is the full version of fellowship, intimate sharing. We want no part with the demonic. Verse 21. You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and of the cup of demons. You cannot partake, you can't be part of the Lord's table and the table of demons. And so then he goes on to explain how to handle Edmoth offered to idols and the bigger spiritual point that we need to be mindful of other people's consciences and we need to seek the benefit of other people. But he makes this point using this fact that we share together at God's table. We share from his provision. We're in fellowship with each other through that very act. And so, as Expositors says in their commentary, fellowship is not simple to understand. It's been, this term fellowship has been translated communion, participation, a shared common life, a partnership. The root meaning means common or shared, as to be contrasted with one's own. And it includes the ideas of being joined together in partnership. In an intimate, mutual sharing between partners. So now let's go back and read First John. And we'll see if it's any more clear. First John and verse one. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, Christ. the life was manifested, and we have seen, and bear witness, and declare to you that the eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. That we can join what they have seen and have declared. John in this case. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. In what way are you and I joined? to the Father and the Son and Judge. I have 12 things. We share being in the light. We share being in God's household and feeding from his provisions. We share in mystery. We share in participation in the Holy Spirit. We share in the divine nature, which is holy, righteous character. We share in the desire to benefit others. We share in God's glory. We share in peace. Okay. We share in the inheritance, which includes eternal life. 
we share in the temple. We share in the kingdom of God. And we share in God's family. And so John continues in verse 4. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. After just reading that list, I mean, who can't help but be joyful? I mean, that's a fantastic list of things to share. In. To be sons of God. It's great. Verse 5. This is the message which we heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, if we're joined to him and we walk in darkness, then we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Everybody in the light is joined together, united. We are all jointly invested as partners in God's family name. He joins us together in an intimate relationship with himself and the Son and each other. And like our stressed out young adults that come first time to church with some other person, we are with each other and the Son and the Father. The church is not a club or a social group. It is not our own. but rather it is something that is shared and come with the Father himself. And like that curtain in the wilderness, God joins us through the entire land. That's the process we're enjoying. The full land. And of course, Christ is the head of this one body. So Paul continues... And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This is an acknowledgement that we are not yet perfect. And so as imperfect beings, to me, the standard becomes even more clear of what we're shooting for. To be joined together. The standard is fellowship with the Father, the Son, and everybody else that's walking in the light. And anything short of that means that we must repent, we must grow, we must overcome. In this sermon, I promise to refresh and perhaps deepen our understanding of fellowship and then discuss the implications of the pastor. Because Paul makes the connection. What does this have to do with Passover and our preparation? We read that in 1 Corinthians 10 because it appears that the Corinthian church, they couldn't agree on whether or not you should eat meat sacrificed to idols. And Paul takes this problem, this discussion, and he raises it up to the spiritual point of who have we joined ourselves to? And eating the New Testament Passover, that meal states our decision of where we've joined ourselves. Now to me, interesting, it's a very interesting phenomenon of eating food together with a group of people. I mean, it's a mutual sharing, and I have this suspicion that God uses it to show a state of change in relationship. In my notebook of sermon ideas, I haven't been able to get to it yet. It can be an awesome experience of enjoying a meal together, and it can also reveal underlying tensions. I remember this one time we were at the Feast of Tabernacles. I was like, I have 14, 14, something like that. 
And it seemed like we drove for hours to go over this. We were in Spokane, Washington for the feast, and it's the last great day, and we drove to Idaho to go to this restaurant by the water. Beautiful restaurant, fine silverware, and nice napkins, and everything was plush. Wonderful, fabulous, excellent meal, fantastic meal. We're sitting there talking as a family, enjoying it, and then a topic came up at the table. And it felt like the table itself just cracked a bit. You could feel the tension of the table. There were different views about the topic, let alone. And that meal sticks with me to this very day that I had my head down. I wasn't involved. I was just an easy bystander. So, you know, that narrows it down to a handful of people. And, uh, yeah, it was so intense. I, I remember just looking at the way. Sharing a meal can be fantastic. And it can also reveal underlying tensions. Our deal, dinner was not the whole. It ended well, so it was a tough moment. And so, Paul opens his letter to the Corinthian church saying, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there is no divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. And so contention and division show up as one of the themes of 1 Corinthians. And in fact, it shows up in how they dine together. Please take a look at 1 Corinthians 11. I'm smiling because Mr. Blanker remarked last week that you can hear the pages turn. And so you'll know where everybody is in Chicago. I think more people are on the digital side of life. So you never know when to go. But here it's very helpful. I was just, it's true. It's nice. Okay. Uh, Yes. So to set the context, we already read 1 Corinthians 10, where he's talking about meat sacrifice to idols, and he raises this fact that the, in the Passover we're joining ourselves to the Father and the Son and each other, and we don't you know, participate in the demonic realm, etc. And then in chapter 11, he addresses two other contentions that are going on. And then in chapter 12, he shares and educates with the Corinthian church about the composition of the body. This is those three chapters in a row. And that in chapter 12, he talks about how there are various people with gifts and how they edify each other, offices, and all those kinds of things. So let's roll back to chapter 11, and we'll take a look at the meaning. Chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. First of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, And in part, I believe it, for there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. One is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. That's what he says. Now what was not praised? What was done in an unworthy gift? Well, how can you enjoy a shared intimate dinner when there's division, what do you Paul says that one person takes his supper ahead of another. That's taking. That's not sharing. That's not having things in common. Some disdained others by their impatience. 
they ate before the other people arrived at the dinner. And commentaries suggest that there may have been separate private rooms in these dinners. And so you might have a room for those who thought Paul was awesome, and you had a room for people who favored Apollos, sitting in different rooms at the same meal. And there's an imbalance in this sharing. Some were hungry, others were drunk. That's not that. And it appears that this meal included a community outreach within the church that those who didn't have enough food could come and be fed. But then Paul says that those people that were in that condition that needed help to be fed were shamed because they show it up to the pop-up without something to break. Is any of that worthy of sons of God? And so Paul goes on to give instructions about the details of the Passover and that they weren't doing what Christ expected. And we'll, we'll read that during the Passover service. And what I thought was interesting, I didn't know this, is that uh, some Bible scholars believe that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians before any of the Gospels had been written. And so this is most likely the earliest instruction on eating the New Testament Passover, which I thought was interesting. So verse 27 then, we're going to skip over how to, how to do Passover, because that will come up later, I'm sure. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner is guilty of the blood, the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. We're joined in the Lord's body. Therefore, we share in the provisions from his household. And we share in the temple and the divine nature and benefiting others and peace and his family name and being in the light and all these things. And how can you go to Passover and have contempt for your brother? It is not our body. It's the Lord's body. We joined ourselves to his body, and so did everybody else who keeps the Passover instruction. And so Paul pleads with the Corinthian church that they would discern the Lord's body and not heap up judgment on themselves because of their own. We must be mindful of our conduct within the Lord's body. And so he continues in verse 30. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Now we're a couple weeks out from Passover. This is the rededication of our choice to join God's body and enter fellowship with the Father, the Son, and each other. And it's a statement of our union a shared partnership, and a joint inheritance. Now, how could we eat this meal sitting next to a spouse who's we're all stressed out because we know that there's some division or tension? Or, like my meal, you have to eat it looking down because you're afraid you might catch somebody else's eye and know, like, oh, there's this massive thing that's out there. Because we're not reconciled. I thought it interesting. The Bible remarks in Deuteronomy 29 that ancient Israel never ate bread and wine for 40 years in the wilderness. And in Scripture, Deuteronomy 29 and verse 6, why is that in there? And I suspect it's because they never really fellowshiped with the Father and the Son and with each other. You 
you know, Mark records in Christ's words after the Passover with his disciples, he says, But I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom, another meal. And I assume this is the wedding supper of the Lamb, and this is a change of state for sure. Forever in fellowship with the Father, the Son, and each other. And I'm excited to share that meal. Rejoicing in the fruit of all of our labor of this life as we strive to overcome lying and pride and lust and discord and all the other things that we're reflected on. And I, could, I thought, well, maybe Christ doesn't need to drink wine, but he doesn't need that reminder of what it means to be joined together with the Father. Until in this message, I intended to refresh our understanding of fellowship and perhaps even it. And I thought this study might impact our Passover preparations and observance. What is fellowship exactly? It is to be joined together in a shared purpose, an effort, and inheritance. I thought it helpful to study it. It was very valuable, and I hope you did as well. Thanks.